uh, to the Variety in Focus Pinot Noir session. The first of our Variety in Focus sessions, in fact, the first online event that we've done at the WSET. Um, so this is very much, um, yeah, a new thing for all of us. So um, if anything goes wrong, I don't know how to stop it. Hopefully it won't though, we should all be fine. Um, so my name is Julia Lambeth. I'm one of the educators at WCT School London. Um, I've been with the WCT uh, not that long, but I've been an educator prior to that um, personally for uh, over five years. I've been in the wine uh, trade for another few years before that. So when you start adding it all together, I've been in the wine trade for quite a long time. Um, and throughout that time, I like I imagine most of you have had an enjoyment, um, possibly even a fascination with uh, Pinot Noir. So, um, plan for this evening is to talk a little bit about the grape variety, um, think about its, its characteristics, where it's grown. Um, I have a wine here that I will uh, be tasting. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and please do taste your own wine. Uh, and I'd love to see your tasting notes at the end if you're willing to share those. Um, so, let's start at the beginning um, with a little bit of an, an introduction to the history of Pinot Noir. So, um, Pinot Noir is often considered one of the oldest grape varieties. Um, it's been grown for potentially over 2,000 years. The name apparently comes uh, from the fact that the bunch of grapes is shaped like a pine cone. Uh, now, if you think like me that most bunches of grapes are shaped like a pine cone, uh, it maybe doesn't make that particularly unique, but there we go. Based on the, the fact it's shaped like a pine cone, um, that's where we get the term Pinot from. And obviously Noir being black, it is a black grape variety. Um, so it's very old. Um, and while we think it's been around for over 2,000 years, there's uh, evidence for it, archaeological evidence, from around the 4th century AD. Um, and records in Burgundy in particular um, go back uh, many centuries. There's evidence there from 11th century. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's one of the varieties that's been around for a long time. Um, its success in Burgundy, it originated in Burgundy, um, and that was really um, due to the success there that it's been uh, distributed around the world. So many countries now uh, grow Pinot Noir somewhere, or they try to grow Pinot Noir somewhere. Um, I'm going to talk in a second about uh, how it's actually a tricky grape variety to grow, so that's why the try to grow Pinot Noir uh, might be more relevant in some places. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's pretty old, but it is also unique. It's also pretty special in terms of its characteristics, and it is one of the most loved grape varieties. So um, it's a tricky little one, it's tricky to grow, tricky to make, um, but I think most people would argue it's worth the effort, and most of us as Pinot Noir drinkers would definitely think it's worth the effort. So uh, it's good that people continue to try. So on to a little bit about the characteristics of Pinot Noir. Um, there you can see a little picture of those pine cone shaped bunches. Oh, didn't know I could do that. Okay, never mind. Um, so to start with, I've put there that it's one of the most demanding grapes for both grape growers and wine makers. Uh, there are actually a number of challenges associated with growing Pinot Noir or turning it into a wine. Um, this is one of the reasons why it can end up being a little bit more on the um, expensive side, shall we say. Um, but people love it. Uh, winemakers love it, so it's often considered to be worth the effort. So what are these challenges then? Well, first off, it's a thin-skinned variety. So when we talk about black grapes, you'll find some that are thin-skinned, like Pinot, and some that are thicker-skinned, like Pinot Sauvignon. Um, being a thin-skinned variety um, means that it does have an effect on the wine that we make. So it'll have uh, generally lighter colour, less tannin than other varieties. 
which is not a, a positive or negative, that's just part of the style. Where it can be a challenge is that thinner skin varieties can be at more risk of diseases in the vineyard. So diseases, uh, fungal diseases associated with humidity are going to have more of an impact on the thin skin variety. So already we're going to have uh, a little bit more challenge. If we think about some of the places that Pinot Noir is grown, it can be grown in, in cool and moderate climates, which also do have uh, a risk of humidity. Um, that's uh, challenge part one. Um, the other challenge of being thin-skinned is that it actually can be a bit hard um, to extract the colour that we want. We know that from Pinot Noir we expect something that's pale, um, but it can still be a little bit tricky to extract enough colour, even to make a wine that we would call pale. So, um, as I've said, both grape growers and winemakers having a challenge here. Um, we talked about um, the other next point to think about in terms of the, the challenge of Pinot Noir is that it's early budding. So early budding here means that in springtime, when the uh, buds burst, is earlier compared to some of the varieties. Uh, this can be a challenge because in springtime is also when we are most at risk of frost. So again, if we think about Pinot Noir in cool or moderate climates, um, it can be um, at risk of um, damage by frost if the buds have already burst, if your new shoots and leaves have already um, been exposed, then there might well be some damage that occurs to those grapes in those early stages. So also tricky. Uh, the next characteristic about Pinot Noir is that it's prone to mutation. Uh, this is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail um, in a minute. Um, but here I've put the importance of clones. So Pinot Noir actually has many, many, many clones. When we talk about Pinot Noir, we're probably not talking about just one version, one clone of Pinot Noir. Most vineyards have a combination of a lot of different ones. Um, and that's going to be a, a part of the style, a part of, again, the great growing that we've talked about. Um, suited to cool and moderate climates mentioned that a couple of times. Um, but again, even in a, a, where we, a place where we know the climate, we're going to have weather variations from year to year. Vintage variation is a term you may well know, even in a climate that we can predict. We can't predict the weather. So we have to work with Pinot Noir, which can reflect changes in the weather, in the vintage variation, and then that means that year to year, you're probably not doing the same thing in the vineyard, you're not doing the same thing in the winery. So you don't just have a formula that works. Um, it's very, it, it needs a bit of detail, a bit, a bit of attention to it. Um, but the advantages are, of course, the style, the wine that it produces. Um, We've mentioned already that Pinot Noir generally is paler in colour, lower in tannin, um, but it has an amazing array of flavours uh, and it's also very expressive in terms of where it's produced. So it's going to have different flavours depending upon whether it's produced in Burgundy or California or New Zealand. And even in greater detail than that, it's going to have different flavours depending upon which part of Burgundy, which vineyard, which part of that vineyard. So it's... It, it's one of the reasons that people really like it is you can kind of really get geeky about it. You can think about the differences that you taste in a Pinot from all of these different places around the world. If you wanted to, you could just put one vineyard next to another vineyard and you should still be able to taste the differences reflected in it. That's clear, Doctor. Only like two, so I just ask everyone to make sure they are on mute again. I can just hear a couple of voices. That would be appreciated. Um, so, yes, um, where was I? Um, expressive, um, but typically, if, we, yeah, if I was to try and describe a typical Pinot Noir, um, we're thinking about predominantly red fruit characteristics, uh, red berries, cherries, cranberries, often very vibrant, fresh red fruit, and um, can have a sort of spiciness or perfumed characteristic to it. Um, can suit oak aging, can suit bottle aging. Um, older Pinot Noirs can go on to develop sort of earthy, savoury, mushroomy characteristics as well. 
Um, whether you manage to keep your Pinot Noirs for that long is another story. Um, but it's all sorts of styles you can get. Um, now, one of the um, downsides to this tricky, demanding bait variety um, is that it can be more expensive. So, with Pinot Noir, we associate it with high quality, we associate it with complexity. However, that is uh, literally the price we have to pay. Um, I think it's okay. Pinot Noir every now and again. Bit of a treat. So... <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit more about clones next. Uh, I haven't switched slides yet, guys. Um, it's just a very slow-moving presentation today. So uh, hopefully everyone sees the Clone Wars slide now. Um, not because there are wars about clones. That uh, is purely a Star Wars reference uh, for my own amusement. Um, so clones for Pinot Noir. So when we talk about... Um, grape varieties, if you think of propagation of a particular grape variety, if you want to make sure that you keep the same grape variety in your vineyard year after year, then you can't propagate it by planting a seed from that grape. If I was to plant a seed from a Pinot Noir grape or a Merlot grape or a Chardonnay grape, I would get a different variety. So the only way to ensure that I keep the same variety is to use cuttings or um, other methods, layering, things like that. So for cuttings, for example, I would literally cut the shoot, the end of the shoot of my existing Pinot Noir vine, and I could plant that, and that would grow into a Pinot Noir again. Now, the trouble with Pinot Noir is that it is uh, genetically unstable, um, which sounds quite painful, but I'm sure it's not. Uh, and what this means is that um, even when it grows into the same grape variety, there are slight variations within the grape variety, which are known as clones. So Pinot Noir, as you can see, has um, over 2,000 clones potentially that exist. Um, to put this into uh, comparison with Cabernet Sauvignon, that has about 20 clones. So both very old varieties, but Pinot Noir definitely has this um, function to it where it changes more um, over the course of propagation. Um, so let's think about what the things are that can change. So the things that might be different in different clones could be the yield. Uh, how many grapes are produced per vine? Yield is often a very important measure for controlling quality in vineyards. So uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, higher yield or lower yield may be more beneficial. Uh, disease resistance can be another factor. Um, some clones will develop disease um, resistance uh, to particular threats in the vineyard, which can be very useful. Um, the downside of this is if you have limited genetic variation among your, um, among your vines, um, it can be susceptible to uh, a particular disease, uh, another disease, for example. So if it's um, all one type, it may be resistant to one thing, but not to anything else. So having a mixture is often considered to be uh, best in order to not only prove disease resistance, but also to add to complexity. When we talk about tasting wines, when we talk about the quality of any wine, we'll always think about the uh, complexity. Uh, so one of the ways we can manage that is by having a number of different clones within our vineyard. Um, cold hardiness have also put as a factor there. Um, again, when we talk about Pinot, we're thinking about cold, cool or moderate climates. So we need something that has the ability to withstand that without too much of a struggle. Um, so most vineyards these days will be a combination of a number of different clones. Um, we'll also find different clones in different places around the world. Um, so, and there's been a lot of movement among the years as well. So lots of, still, what's still considered Pinot Noir, um, but just slightly different versions of it. Um, question just spotted there from Arnico, and when does it become a different grape? Only when it's crossed. Um, not necessarily only when it's crossed. So a crossing is when you take two different grape varieties and cross fertilize them, and then that's when we get the seeds. Um, it's actually a good question in relation to Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir sometimes does vary so significantly 
that it turns into a new grape variety. So Pinot Noir you've heard of, yes, that's why you're here. Uh, Pinot Grigio you've heard of, Pinot Mernier, Pinot Blanc. These are actually all mutations of Pinot Noir. Uh, grapes that have grown which are so distinct from the original material from Pinot Noir that they then are new grape varieties in their own right. Um, so there's actually a few different ways to make a different grape variety. Um, question from Silvana about will it be considered organic or natural? That's down to each individual um, grape grower's choice. So... Let us move on to some of the types of wine we can get from Pinot Noir. So we've talked about how Pinot Noir is a black grape variety, but that does not mean it makes exclusively red wines. So in fact, um, you can find all types of wine made from Pinot Noir. Um, sparkling is um, it's very common for use in sparkling wine. So you'll know that in Champagne, it's one of the traditional three grape varieties used there. Um, here, again, thinking about clones, we have a particular um, array of clones which are better suited to making sparkling wine, uh, tend to have um, skins that have less colour, less tannin, have higher acidity. So if we know that we're making a sparkling wine from this grape, here we can find the clone that's best suited for that. Um, now you may find sparkling wine, uh, champagne, that is a combination of different grapes, or you can even find single varietal Pinot Noir Champagne. Uh, often this will be labelled Oh, just hearing someone's microphone there. If you can mute yourself again, that would be lovely. Um, so yes, uh, single varietal Pinot Noir sparkling wine does exist. And often it's thought that the Pinot will bring more body, more structure to the wine. So a single varietal sparkling Pinot Noir would taste quite different to um, uh, something that's a blend of all three grape varieties. Um, we were supposed to be doing this originally rather than a webinar and I've got an awesome Blanc de Noir Champagne that I will one day share on that tasting again. So uh, watch the space, everyone. Um, so, sparkling wine we know, um, white wine, you can also get um, still white wine made from Pinot Noir as well. Um, not so common this one, um, does exist, uh, often more found in cooler climates where perhaps the skins of the grape haven't ripened quite so successfully as you might want. Uh, when we think about grapes ripening, yes we need sugar, we want to balance the acid and the flavour. Um, but um, the skins need to be ripe as well. So if the skins aren't ripe, we can still make a wine. We just exclude the skins um, and we will make a white wine instead. Uh, rosé as well, of course. Um, quite a few places make Pinot Noir rosé. Uh, here again, we're looking at a slightly different method. So here we do want to keep some skin contact. We want to get some colour from those skins into the wine, um, but obviously not as much as we would do for a red wine. So a short maceration, a short amount of skin contact, and we end up with a wine that is uh, paler, but has, um, again, the kind of fruitiness, the acidity, the freshness, the structure that we associate with Pinot. Um, and you can get some really elegant rosé wines made from Pinot Noir. Sancerre rosé, uh, for example, is, uh, is pretty awesome. However, that's not what we're here for, is it, really? I imagine when we said Pinot Noir tasting, you didn't think, oh yes, I love my Pinot Noir rosé. I think most people are here because they're thinking about red wines. Um, and this is, of course, the majority of wine that we see produced using Pinot Noir, but there are uh, many, many different styles. So some of the factors that are going to influence the style we've mentioned already, where it's grown, the climate, um, the type of soil in the region, the selection of clones that are used. Um, when it comes to winemaking, there's even more options we can think about there. Um, we can think about whether the winemaker might use some whole bunches in their fermentation. Whole bunches can have an effect of just adding a brighter fruity flavour, softening tannins slightly. 
Um, we're talking more about the, a, a small proportion of whole bunches rather than um, carbonic maceration like you, like you might see in Beaujolais. Um, but it is practiced in a few regions. Or we might see our normal um, traditional crushed fruit fermentation. So where all the grapes are crushed before fermentation um, and then that will make a wine in a slightly different style instead. Um, other factors that we need to think about, as well as how we ferment the wine, include oak ageing. Um, many um, Pinot Noir wines will have some contact with oak, doesn't always have to. Um, but because Pinot is quite delicate, once again, we might find that using 100% new oak can be too much. Um, often we think about Pinot Noir, we're thinking about maybe slightly older barrels or larger barrels or a combination of different types. Um, but then again, that will be down to the winemaker who will know the type of wine that they want to produce at the end of it. Uh, just catching up on a couple of questions, is that the best wine for ageing? Um, don't know which wine you're referring to there, I'm afraid, Anita. Um, best wine for ageing? Um, it can be a number of different wines. A lot um, high quality wine, I'd say, is what you're looking for if you're looking for a wine to keep. Um, why a whole bunch of fermentation is suitable for Pinot Noir? Um, so, again, talking about a, a few whole bunches retained within the crushed fruit, um, rather than carbonic or semi-carbonic maceration, generally, uh, just to answer your question there as well. Um, and it's not just suitable for Pinot Noir. It's actually suitable for a lot of great varieties. It's just down to the particular style of wine that you want to make. So if you want to leave some whole bunches in with your crushed fruit, um, that will just mean that you have this brighter fruit character that comes out. It can also have an effect on the um, texture, the nature of the tannins as well. So it's just, as always, the choice of the winemaker. So many choices. Um, and then, as well as talking about the choice for um, how long to age it for in oak, we also have the choice about whether to keep it in bottle after it's been bottled to develop those uh, tertiary characteristics that can be, again, one of the really appealing parts of Pinot Noir. Um, so lots of, of different types, different styles. So next, I just want to touch upon some regions. Um, question from Sarah there, can the same grapes make all styles of wine, i.e. red and champagne or different varieties of Pinot Noir use? So um, yeah, you'll have different clones that are better suited to different types of wine. So in Champagne they use particular clones, in Burgundy they use particular clones. Um, you'll have other clones in other parts of the world, so that will be uh, very much a factor in terms of the style of wine produced. Typical characteristics from white Pinot? That's a good question. I've not had that much white Pinot. Um, tends not to be quite as um, red fruit dominated compared to uh, the red Pinot that, we've, that I've seen before. It's more kind of a delicate, little bit kind of perfumed, a little bit floral. Uh, if anyone has more detailed tasting note for a white Pinot, please do feel free to type it in. Uh, so what I was going to talk about next were regions. So I've put the wine map of the world up here. This you should hopefully be familiar with. So we can see our latitudes 30 to 50 degrees north and south of the equator. Um, but as we've already mentioned, Pinot Noir is a great variety. It prefers cool or moderate climates. So um, it is a little bit more restricted than uh, some varieties. You can't really just plant it anywhere. Um, but that said, it is planted in an awful lot of places. Uh, if we think about France, first off, um, so Champagne, Burgundy, we've already mentioned, uh, the Loire Valley, Alsace in France are quite famous to, um, also for Pinot Noir production. Uh, you can get a bit in Jura and Limoux in the south of France. Uh, south of France may be the one that's surprising, but Limoux being higher in altitude, being cooler by virtue of that altitude can actually make some wonderful wines, albeit again in a different style to what we'd expect elsewhere in France. Um, a question on artificial irrigation. 
Um, yeah, artificial irrigation will affect um, the production of any vine. Um, irrigation in some places is essential. We know that vines need a certain amount of water to survive, um, but the amount of irrigation is really what's crucial. So some places will not be able to, so that's that done. Some places will be able to, but will choose not to. Um, this is often where um, we want to make a wine that is expressive of the region. Um, and then some places, uh, if they use a lot of water, it, that can be where potentially you get uh, an effect on the quality of the wine. Um, Lucy is saying there's English Pinot Noir too now. Of course there is. Um, brings us nicely onto Europe. Um, Canadian producers doing Blanc de Noir, lovely. Is production of Pinot Noir in cold climate or hot climate? Um, for Pinot Noir, we talk about cool to moderate climates. Um, one of the things that can be that can happen in Pinot Noir when grown in a warm climate is it loses some of its delicate flavour and it can become jammy. Um, and this can it, it makes a wine that's nice, but it doesn't always taste as Pinot Noir y as it should do. Um, I remember when I was studying for my diploma many years ago, um, I was introduced to the word pinosity. A Pinot Noir has pinosity about it, which means that it should taste like a Pinot Noir. So if you grow it somewhere that's too warm and it loses that characteristic, then, I don't know, it's, it's not Pinot enough for me, that's for sure. Um, so then this does mean that when we look at other countries, we do have to find, particularly in some of the new world regions that we'll come to, the cooler parts of the region, the parts where we have more of a moderating factor to ensure that we can grow Pinot Noir in the right way to make sure that it's um, got the characteristics that we want. Um, a question there on global warming. Um, yeah, absolutely. Pinot Noir, like any other grape variety in the world, is, is going to have troubles when it comes to uh, changes in temperature in growing regions. Um, stylistic changes occurring already, but um, as the years go on, if it continues to increase, then yeah, it's going to be a challenge for some traditional Pinot Noir producers. Um, where are we talking? Talking about regions, we've mentioned England, uh, other places in Europe, there's loads of them. Um, Germany, quite famous for high quality Pinot Noir. Um, they call it Sped Burgunder there, so be careful, same grape variety, different name. Uh, also in Italy, Pinot Nero, same grape variety, different names. So much like a lot of the other grape varieties, it's just called different things in different places. Um, otherwise, someone's mentioned Spain already, I've seen that. We can have Austria, Switzerland, um, quite traditional producers for uh, Pinot. Um, some other countries you may not be so familiar with, uh, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia, a lot of Eastern European countries also making lots of Pinot. Um, in fact, I was reading recently about Romania being one of the more places to source slightly more reasonably priced Pinot, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, question from Tony, is Pinot used as part of the blend in a red wine? Uh, rarely would be the answer to that. Um, with wine, it's always um, nothing is impossible. So someone somewhere will be blending Pinot Noir. But as I was just trying to say, really, part of the value of Pinot Noir is that it has this unique characteristic, this unique trait to it. So to blend it would mean potentially you would lose some of that. Um, so um, often we see Pinot Noir as a single variety of wine. The champagne being, obviously, a big exception to that. Oh, so Hungary as well. Didn't say Hungary, apologies. Um, in the rest of the world, I was coming on to Argentina, I promise. Um, but yeah, we can think about outside of Europe. Um, in uh, Argentina has been mentioned, Chile, uh, North America, Canada has been mentioned, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, like lots of different um, places. But it's in these regions where we need to start thinking about the cooler parts of the countries that are going to be best suited to Pinot. So in America, um, California makes loads of Pinot, but it's, it has to be in the parts that are cooled by fog or by breezes. Someone's just pointed out Oregon there. Absolutely. Oregon, slightly further north in terms of its latitude, naturally a bit cooler. So it's actually really well suited to Pinot Noir. Um, 
I recently, recently, last year, had some Pinot Noir from Texas. Hmm. Uh, Texas, not such uh, a moderate climate there. It was not the best. Uh, well, there you go. Everyone has a go. Um, so, various parts in America. Um, in Chile, again, we're thinking about the more coastal regions, which are cooler. Uh, Argentina, of course, we have the altitude of the Andes. Um, and then again, in South Africa, Australia, um, you'll find that many of the vineyards there, we're looking at the cooler parts, uh, coastal parts, or the altitude parts that are best if you know. Um, and then New Zealand, of course, uh, you can see from the map there that New Zealand is naturally a little bit further south in terms of its latitude. Uh, so it does have a little bit of a cooler climate there anyway. Um, so we're also seeing some excellent Pinot produced there as well. Washington, Kazakhstan, England, oh my goodness, Pinot everywhere. Um, so I think you get the idea essentially, there's lots of Pinot grown around the world. Um, some places it's maybe more naturally suited to the climate, other places it's not. Um, Oh, I've just seen a question from Eric, Pinot Noir in Santa Barbara. Um, Santa Barbara, even though it's in Southern California, actually is quite well cooled by um, breezes that are funneled in from the ocean. So even though latitude wise, it's not cool, the vineyard area is more moderate. It, is, it does have a cooling factor there. Um, so, of all these regions, um, I picked a couple just to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I uh, certainly don't know enough about Pinot Noir in Kazakhstan to start there. Um, but just to give you some ideas of the different regions and the different, um, different types of Pinot we get there. Um, so first off, we will of course start with Burgundy. Um, as I've said, the home for Pinot Noir. Um, Burgundy produces a lot of Pinot um, and a lot of different styles, different qualities. So if we think about the sub-regions of Burgundy, um, we've got the Cote d'Or in the north here, which is really, by most people, considered to, pr to produce uh, some of the best Pinot Noirs in the world. Um, we're looking at a, an array of south, southeast facing slopes, good exposure, um, which produce some really concentrated, really complex, really structured expressions of Pinot Noir. Um, and here in Burgundy is really where you can start getting into some of the kind of the nitty gritty detail, the differences between um, different vineyards. Uh, if you look at where the Cote d'Or is, you can see it's quite a long thin region uh, and that's all split into different villages as you work your way through and these each have a different appellation. So if we're in one village and over the road is another village, uh, it's a different appellation. It produces a wine that can have just subtle differences in their style. And that's going to be down to um, a lot of the time the soil. The soil in Burgundy is very complex. So even over quite a small area, we can see changes in the soil that are going to be reflected in the wine. Um, and again, this idea that Pinot Noir is very um, uh, responsive, that it reflects these, these changes is one of the reasons it can be so interesting. Um, the picture here I quite like, so you can see the village in the middle here. Um, at the bottom we've got some vines that are planted on the flatter parts, um, but at the top here you can see some vines um, planted on the slopes just above the village. Um, and it's this aspect, these slopes, that are often really key to producing the higher quality wines. Um, within Burgundy, you probably know it's, it's not just as simple as having uh, an appellation on it. We also get um, the better vineyards have their own appellations. So you can see Premier Cru, Grand Cru wines, which are the ones that take advantage of this favourable aspect. The soil, the elevation, the drainage, the better um, uh, clones, the lower yielding, the older vines, all of these things come together to make uh, some of the most complex wines in the world. Um, so I know a few people were drinking some Burgundy tonight. Hope you are feeling quite proud of yourselves with that. Um, Pinot Noir also grown in other places in Burgundy. So while the Cote d'Or is famous for um, the most prestigious, the higher quality wines in the Cote Chalonnais, uh, just a little bit further south, we can get some also excellent wines. 
um, can sometimes be a little bit lighter, slightly higher in terms of altitude here, ripen a little bit slower, retain more acidity, so a bit different style. And then in the Maconne um, is often where we get more of the sort of simple, lower quality wines. Um, but yeah, lots of, lots of higher quality wine produced there. Compare that to um, the other region I was going to mention, um, not for any particular reason, um, was New Zealand. Um, maybe just because I also wanted to highlight, even within um, some of the New World countries, that we still have variations in terms of subregion and styles that can be produced. Um, just catching up on a few questions here before I go into that. How has climate change affects Pino within Burgundy? Um, yeah, I mean, again, I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier, we'll just be talking about how the grapes are getting riper currently. So riper grapes are going to have a slightly different profile. Um, it's going to have to be more careful about the balance between the sugar, acidity, flavour and so on with harvest. So a few challenges, well, a few differences. Um, different appellations use different vineyard management techniques. Um, not really in Burgundy so much, it's quite consistent there. Um, you, all, you all have variation depending on soil type. It might be slightly different clones um, or might be more to do with density yields, things like that. What makes Burgundy and Pinot be so age-worthy? Um, it's quality, really. When we think about aging potential for a wine, it comes from intensity of flavour and structure. So the more you have of both of these, the more age-worthy a wine will be. Um, so when we're talking about our top Grand Cru Burgundies, these have potential for quite a long time. Um, but it doesn't mean it's only Burgundian wines that are going to have that potential. Um, some of the best wines from New Zealand, as we have a picture of it here, would also have similar ageing potential. So... Um, it's about the quality rather than which particular region that it's from. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Where were we? Uh, New Zealand. So, you yeah, know, you can see here a picture of um, New Zealand. Looks quite different um, to the picture of Burgundy that we saw just now. A few regions in New Zealand have a reputation for high quality Pinot Noir. Um, Martinborough, Marlborough, Central Otago, you may be familiar with those. Um, Marlborough, more famous um, for its sort of more fruity, red fruited styles, a little bit lighter in body and tannin, whereas Central Otago in the south, um, we're looking more at this sort of um, continental climate down here where we get um, a lot of sunshine. Grapes can actually get quite ripe in here. Um, even start to get some of those black fruit flavours. can be a little bit more spicy, fuller bodied by comparison. Um, so it's not just in Burgundy where we can see this variation of different styles of Pinot. It's, it's all countries around the world will be able to show the different potentials, the different styles of Pinot. Um, grown in different types of soil, different environments. Um, right, this uh, feels like a good point to just have a little, a little pause and sip of wine because um, I've not done so, so far. Um, so if you haven't done so either, uh, you've been very patient, <laughs> but cheers. Um, so I did go for a Burgundy wine tonight. I've gone for a wine from Boom, um, Premier Cru, of course. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just going to have a little taste, excuse me. Um, so here we go, just if you're interested in the label. Bone Grev Premier Crew, uh, 2016. Cheers, Gemma. Um, and this really has, you know, everything that you want for Pinot. So we've got those um, lovely red fruits here, very fresh, crisp red fruits, a little bit spicy, um, got some nice soft oak influence there. Um, and it's 2016, so it's still quite young, but starting to see some of those more savoury elements coming through. Um, tannin's quite firm, um, but not too, not too high, as again, we'd expect with the Pinot Noir. Um, this one feels to me like 
I could have kept it for a bit longer. Too late now. Um, but at the moment, it's still just, it's really fresh, really bright, um, and it, it's quite delicious. So I hope you're enjoying yours. Um, question on blind tasting. What would drag you to NZ instead of Burgundy? Um, a lot of the time for New Zealand, you know, what I find is more fruit intensity. So, oh yeah, someone starts it for me. Amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, greater amount of fruit, still with some of the more savoury characteristics, but it's just a, a change in the balance of flavour. Um, where with Burgundy, I expect a little bit more of the savouriness to be coming through and some fruitiness. In a New Zealand, I'd expect it to be the other way around. So, this brings me on to, oops, no, too quickly. On to the question that um, really started this tasting, which is, why are we so into Pinot? Um, there's another number of suggestions here. It's complex. As a wine, it's going to give us a tasting note that has lots of different characteristics to it. Um, we've already said it can make lots of different styles. It can handle oak aging. It can develop in bottle. Um, we've talked about the different clones, so the, different, the way it reacts to different soils. So wherever you taste it from, it's going to be different. Um, and that appeals to the wine geek in most of us, I think. Um, second point I wanted to make is that it can be more food friendly um, than some other varieties. When we think about um, varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, which have such high tannins, um, it can be a little bit tricky to match with certain foods. Whereas Pinot, it's a little bit softer in terms of tannin. It's still got good acidity, still got good flavour, uh, but it could just have a little bit, it's a bit more forgiving with more of a wider range of foods. Um, the next few points um, were just things that I've seen on tasting notes for Pinot Noir over the years. Ethereal, sensual, sex in a glass. I mean, that's not how my tasting notes go, but <laughs> you get the idea. People get really excited about Pinot, about this uh, flavour, this structure that it provides that you just can't get from anything else. Um, people have written poems about Pinot Noir. I, if you want to have... A little Google, I'm sure you can find um, some poems from Pinot. I've looked them up before. Uh, I'm yet to find one which I found amazing. So if you do find a really good one, let me know. Um, if you would like to perform it to me, even better. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, again, coming back to this idea that it inspires people. Uh, oh, another question. How about Grenache? How do you compare Grenache to Pinot? Um, Grenache compared to Pinot tends to have more alcohol more body, so it feels heavier and it has more of a warming characteristic. Um, a slightly different flavour profile, while it's still red fruits, um, you get a little bit more, I think, of the perfume, uh, savoury elements with Pinot that I would expect. Um, instead, question about minerality from Burgundy. Oh, minerality. Um, I mean, if we think about minerality as flavours that come from the soil, then yeah, once again, because Pinot Noir expresses that really well, then if we're talking about wines produced on different soils, that's always going to be reflected in the flavour. Um, so, I've talked a little bit about why I think Pinot is so good, um, but I also have a little video clip I want you to watch from the movie Sideways. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this film, it's a really good film, um, but in it, the main character um, loves wine and um, has a little speech about why wine is so good. So that's the bit that I want to share with you. Let's just get that started. Why are you so into Pinot? <laughs> I mean, it's like a thing with you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's a hard grape to grow, as you know, right? So uh, it's thin skin, temperamental, ripens early. It's, you know, it's not a survivor like Howard, which can just grow anywhere and uh, thrive even when it's neglected. No, Pinot needs constant care and attention. In fact, it can only grow in these really 
really specifically tucked away corners of the world. Only the most patient and nurturing of growers can do it, really. Only somebody who really takes the time to understand Bano's potential can then coax it into its fullest expression. Flavors are just the most haunting and brilliant and thrilling and subtle. So there we go. I hope you all were able to see that. Um, if not, I can post the link to the video clip later if you'd like to see it. Um, but I think it just gives you an idea of, again, talking about you know why is it so unique? Why is it different to the other great varieties that we talk about? Um, it's just, I don't know. As a person that is quite a big wine geek, looking at other people talking about wine in a geeky way makes me happy. So, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, and that really does bring us to the end of what I had to say about Pinot. Um, so, it does bring us to the opportunity to, to, for you to ask about any questions. Um, sorry about the sound on the video, John. I will find a way to share um, that link with you, or you can just find it in um, YouTube if you're interested. Um, classic movie that sabotaged Merlot. Oh, it did, didn't it? Apparently, they uh, stopped uh, planting so much Merlot was the direct result of the movie. Too bad. Um, if you haven't got any questions, that's fine. Um, you can see some dates of our other um, events that are coming up soon, our other online events. Um, make sure you get those in the calendar, make sure you get registered. Um, saw a question about different names for clones. Yes, they have different names or often numbers. Uh, they're called things like 779MV6, so they're not the most romantic names for the most part. Um, I think I saw another question, but I forgot to read it in time. So uh, sorry about that. Repeat it if you want to. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's been, um, as I say, the first time we've done this. So quite exciting for me. Um, I hope to see you back here for some of the other events that we've got coming up. Uh, we will be planning more. So keep an eye out. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be hanging around. Um, if you want to keep in touch with us, uh, make sure that you're connected on the socials or through the uh, newsletter. Um, we've got a lot of things going on and I hope you can join them. Uh, otherwise, I think you're all just saying thank you. So that's really nice. Thank you. Um, I will stop the recording now, in fact, because that is the end.